वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई एम तेजिंदर सिंह एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस सेवेंथ डॉक्टर रीता सूद मेमोरियल ओवेशन आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर अंशु टू काइंडली स्टार्ट द प्रोसीडिंग्स गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी एंड वेलकम टू द सेवेंथ डॉक्टर रीता सूद मेमोरियल ओवेशन दिस द नेक्स्ट इन द सीरीज ऑफ द ओवेशंस ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय द एमयू इंडिया Uh, today uh, the oration is being delivered by dr k ram narayan who is uh, a very renowned educationist and let me bask in reflected glory saying that he is a pathologist like me uh, and several generations of uh, students uh, have been guided by him uh, he is currently the pro chancellor of sikkim manipal university uh, he is the professor of medical education at the manipal academy of higher education and the chief national coordinator Uh, of the dth swayam prabha especially involved in content development for medicine uh, today he will be speaking on the uh, intriguing and very interesting topic of celebrating teacherhood let me briefly introduce dr ram narayan to you previously he has served as the vice chancellor of the manipal academy of higher education he has been the vice president um, for faculty development at the manipal academy of higher education and the chairperson of the manipal university at jaipur he has also served as the dean of the malaka manipal medical college he has graduated from the stanley medical college madras he has done his post graduation in pathology from the kasturba medical college in manipal and he has a pg diploma in higher education from the indira gandhi national open university he has been awarded the ecfmg foreign faculty fellowship in basic sciences in 1986 and he's been the recipient of the famous short term exchange fellowship in academic leadership uh, from the USA in 2002 he is a recipient of several uh, orations and awards he had been awarded the mr parthasarathi av ramaprasad karnataka chapter iapm oration in 2021 in the same year he was awarded the shri dharmasthala manjus manjunateshwara scm university darwad oration He is a recipient of the Bloomberg UTV Business School Excellence Award for outstanding contribution to education and the New Year Award in 2004 for for distinguished work and achievement in the field of education. Uh, he has a number of edu- uh, uh, publications in higher education and these are a few of his uh, recent uh, publications and a cursory glance at them will show you how uh, up to date he has been and how interesting his uh, 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 work is i think all of us are familiar with that famous video on where he talks about how to give a lecture and i'm sure today's uh, oration on celebrating teacherhood will be as interesting and as memorable ha- i hand this over to you dr ram narayan uh, over to you may i share the screen uh, sanjay can you see the screen sanjay yes sir we can see your screen yes sir yeah we can all right warm greetings to each and uh, every one of you it is a unique honor privilege and uh, indeed a pleasure to give this uh, rita sood memorial oration let me begin with a picture which is very special it's a treasure of a picture way back in 2008 i met dr rita sood for the first time in the campus of sikkim manipal university it was a north east zonal workshop on student assessment and this was my first meeting and since then there were several occasions when i could meet dr rita sood later she was the external examiner for one of my phd candidates 
this picture is even more special because today i am delivering the dr rita sood memorial oration as i am associated as an integral part of sikkim manipal university my interactions with dr rita sood left me with so much of learning she was always gentle she was always kind but most of all she was always professional in all that she did and today we celebrate dr rita sood as a teacher today we celebrate teacher hood in this oration i'm going to look at the three dimensions of teacher hood i will first look at measuring scholarship of teaching and then go on to the teacher of the future and then the hidden roles of a teacher let me begin with the first measuring scholarship of teaching if you look at the work of boyer way back in 1990 when he described that any academic has four domains and uh, these four domains he called it as scholarship of discovery scholarship of integration scholarship of application and scholarship of teaching in more understandable terms we can call this scholarship of discovery as research which we all understand scholarship of integration is the context in which we all function we all work scholarship of application is the connect connect with the community connect with society the connect that we have with the world around us and then comes the scholarship of teaching which is education so these are the four domains that uh, boyer described mind you way back in 1990 today we are going to focus on this one scholarship which we call the scholarship of teaching or more commonly as education when we look at teaching and research there are two analogies that we need to remember the first analogy is with reference to sin and confession when you commit the sin of teaching you may sometimes confess i don't do too much research the reverse can also happen you commit the sin of research you will at some point of time confess i don't do much teaching though we would like to have both happening hand in hand let us be aware the sin and confession analogy is very appropriate in the context of teaching and research the second analogy is the analogy of the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb cannot exist for too long together they might exist for some time but after some time the lion will overpower will overwhelm and perhaps devour the lamb teaching and research are like that we try to make them coexist but at some point of time either teaching becomes the lion or research becomes the lion and the other one gets devoured so this is reality this is exactly what happens in most situations if teaching predominates research suffers if research predominates teaching suffers though we always say we need to give equal importance to teaching and research so these two analogies are very significant and we need to be aware of this the sin and confession analogy the lion and the lamb analogy when you look at research 
we know how to quantify, we know how to measure research. But if we look at quantifying and measuring teaching, we have difficulties, we have challenges, we have obstacles, and we are not sure how do we measure, how do we quantify teaching and make it count? And it is in this context that we need to be aware of the McNamara fallacy. Fallacy means a false notion. What is this McNamara fallacy? McNamara fallacy is the tendency to make the measurable important rather than making the important measurable. What is somewhat easier to measure. Research, for example, is easier to measure than teaching. So we have a tendency to make research more important rather than making the important, if teaching is important, we have not put in enough effort to make sure that it is measured. So what is easy to measure, we consider it as important. That is what McNamara fallacy says. Basically, it says we measure whatever can be easily measured. And we disregard that which cannot be measured easily. This, has, this is exactly what has happened to teaching. We have measured research. We know how to measure research. We have put the parameters for research. And we have ignored conveniently and comfortably teaching. We presume that which cannot be measured easily is not important and it does not exist. So this is the McNamara fallacy we must be aware of when we look at teaching, the scholarship of teaching. It is in this context that I want to draw your attention to this article by Professor Tejinder Singh and uh, Professor Piyush Gupta. Can we consider scholarship of teaching, learning, rather than focusing only on publications for recognition of medical teachers by National Medical Commission. A recent article, very thought provoking, and I would urge you to read this article because it is time, if you are serious about doing more than lip service to teaching, we need to keep this in mind. An article that was very timely, and I think it is also going to be timeless. When you look at scholarship of teaching and learning, it includes all educational activities compiled in what we call as teaching portfolio. We all have heard of a research portfolio, but a teaching portfolio is a compilation of all educational activities. A teaching portfolio is a systematic collection of information, documenting expertise as an educator, incorporating multiple sources, collected over time, and most important, it has to demonstrate excellence. That is where the challenge comes. How do we have evidence of effectiveness of excellence in teaching? Which is what I'm going to look at in a moment. The use of teaching portfolio could be for formative or for summative reasons. Formative is basically for self-improvement, summative, for career advancement. Now, when you look at a teaching portfolio, what are the inclusions that we would like to have? In a teaching portfolio, normally there is a teaching philosophy, your personal statement about why you are a teacher, what excites you about teaching and so on. And then of course, the second major component is what we call the core areas of educational scholarship, which is what I'm going to explain to you what are the core areas of educational scholarship which one would include in a teaching portfolio. The first, of course, is teaching effectiveness. The second is your role in curriculum development, your contribution in that, your role in advising and mentoring, your role as an education leader and administrator. And fifth one is learner assessment. So these are the five major components, the five core areas of educational scholarship. 
I'm going to spend a little time on the first one because most of us consider teaching effectiveness reflected in student feedback. We think effectiveness of teaching is indicated by the feedback, anonymous or otherwise, that you have from students. What I'm going to share with you is something which you must be aware that it is not just student feedback that matters. So when you look at measuring teaching effectiveness, there are 12 parameters, 12, not one. Unfortunately, we are all aware of only student ratings. We think student ratings is everything about teaching effectiveness. If you have good student ratings, you think you are effective as a teacher. Student ratings are necessary, but not sufficient to measure teaching effectiveness. There are 11 others, which I'm going to share with you. I'm mentioning this just to create that awareness about those total of 12 parameters which measure teaching effectiveness. The second, of course, is peer ratings. It's a pity that teaching has always been a closed door activity. We have never allowed teaching to be peer reviewed. Our research, we allow peer review. That is the essence of publications. You have peer reviewed journals and peer reviews there, but have you ever heard of peer review of teaching? Unless that happens, we will not have a credible documentation of teaching. Let us throw the doors open. Let us make our teaching open to all to view, to observe, and to scrutinize. Peer ratings are important, and you select the peers whom you want. It's not that someone foists someone on you. You select the teachers whom you want to sit in, observe, and comment. So peer ratings are important for teachers, and this is a practice in many universities abroad when they are to go for their career advancement, they have to invite a few teachers to sit in through their sessions and give a feedback. The teachers are chosen by the teacher who is being appraised. So peer ratings are necessary. Self-evaluation all of us do, primarily for introspection and for us to become better. Course evaluations are indicators of teaching effectiveness to some extent, because when you look at the course and the feedback on the course, it does give you some idea. Invitations to teach definitely is an indicator that your teaching is effective and people want to hear you listen to you. Teaching, of course, teaching awards are uh, naturally uh, proof that uh, your teaching is recognized. So these are six. Now there are six more and I'll run through them. Student interviews, focus group discussions, Formal, informal discussion with students give you several insights on how effective your teaching has been. Administrator ratings today have come in in a big way. Whether you like it or not, every organization, every institution will have some sort of rating, which they do sometimes anonymously, sometimes uh, they do it as a annual feature just to see how things are going. So administrator ratings, do give you an indication of teaching effectiveness. Educational research. Can you translate your work that you are doing as a teacher into publications? There are journals, journals which publish very good articles on uh, teaching and uh, educational research is one way in which you can uh, indicate your teaching uh, profile. Attainment of learning outcomes accomplishment of these outcomes do give us an indication about teaching effectiveness. Alumni ratings and employer ratings also contribute. So if you really look at it uh, in totality, there are 12 ways in which you can measure teaching effectiveness. Unfortunately, most of us are aware of only anonymous student feedback, which we consider as the only one to measure teaching effectiveness. There are 11 others. And for you to be more complete in your measurement of teaching effectiveness, it is better that you have more of these, as many of these 12 uh, as you can. That would be more complete in your measurement of teaching effectiveness. Now, when you 
document educational activities, there are two areas. One is excellence in education. Second is engagement. Now, what do you mean by excellence? Excellence has got two components, quantity and quality. You no doubt do several things and document all as educational activities, but you also need to have quality. Unless you have both quantity and quality, you will not be able to document. Now, how we go about this, I'm going to tell you uh, just now. The second part is engagement. Engagement means what? Engagement with our community, our peers. And in that, there are two components. What is it that you have drawn from the field? That is, what are the best practices today? What are the current things happening today? What have you practiced? What have you incorporated into your own? Then comes contribution to the field. What have you done to contribute to the field? So these two components, excellence and engagement, each has got its two sub components, constitutes what is today known as the Q2 engage model. The Q2 engage model basically tells you how to document in such a way that it becomes a credible document. And this work was actually published way back in 2007, Advancing Educators and Education by Defining the Components and Evidence Associated with Educational Scholarship. Basically, how you document educational scholarship. It's a very important and a very significant paper. So much is there in that you could easily glean several things from that article and use it. If one is serious about documenting scholarship of teaching, if one is serious about using it in one's academic work, it's worth looking at this article. There are several things in this which you can use, modify, alter, depending on the need. But it's better that you see this article because you really don't have to reinvent the wheel. Considerable work has been done. And I consider this as a key article when we want to seriously consider the scholarship of teaching and measuring it. We have now looked at the first component, measuring scholarship of teaching. And I've shown you what is the way forward. The second component is the teacher of the future. In a way, it is also the future of the teacher, which is what we are going to see. The teacher of the future is going to be very different from the way we have functioned hitherto. And when we look at the teacher of the future, we must be conscious of this triangle. This triangle of three T's, as I call it, the teacher, the text, and the technology. Text meaning content. When we function effectively as teachers, we need to make sure that there is the right blend of the teacher with the text and technology. Sometimes we tend to lean too much towards text. Sometimes we tend to lean too much towards technology. And sometimes we forget that there is a teacher at all. The teacher often disappears because the text is there and the technology is there. The teacher is not required. Let us remember the teacher of the future is one who will combine ideally, optimally, judiciously, prudently text and technology. We cannot talk about teacherhood without these two words, pedagogy and andragogy. All of us have used it. All of us have occasion to have discussed it. But let me try to explain to you in a way that would make things a bit simpler. When you 
Look at what happens in a school. What we have is pedagogy, peda, peda, child, a child, leading a child, where the teacher decides what the child learns and the teacher also decides how the child learns. So this is what happens in school pedagogy. Then comes andragogy. In andragogy, the teacher decides what teacher in the sense, it could be the university, it could be the regulatory body, it could be the board of studies, whatever. Teacher in the sense, it is decided what has to be learned. This is adult learning happening in higher educational institutions. But the student has the flexibility and freedom, how much to learn, how well to learn, what avenues he will take to learn. So that is where the difference is and that is what adult learning is all about. Andragogy where you give a little more flexibility to the student to explore, to investigate and to study with that freedom and flexibility, which perhaps may not be there in pedagogy. Then comes the third level, a situation where we are in today. The student says, like your children, many of you have children going to school and they will tell you, you don't tell me what to learn. You also don't tell me how to learn. I know. What to learn? I know how to learn. This is what our children are telling us. This is what our students, though they have not said in so many words, this is what is happening. The student wants to decide what to learn. The student wants to decide how to learn. Where is the teacher then? The teacher becomes irrelevant? Not really. The teacher is there to guide and support and encourage. I'll come to that. But having said that, this is the situation of what we call today as problem-based learning, case-based learning, call it whatever you wish. But basically, the student grapples with the problem first. Studying the problem, the student de decides, okay, to learn more, to understand more, to solve this problem, I need to decide to study these things, what to learn. He or she sees the relevance and decides, what to learn. He also is guided by the teacher. This is where the teacher comes in. The teacher is almost unseen, but the student is guided to resources, supported, encouraged, and mentored to learn. So it's really a situation where the student decides, looking at the relevance, what to learn, and he also is given considerable flexibility to go and explore on his own under the guidance of the teacher. Now, this is what we call as Huta Goji. So if you really see pedagogy, andragogy, and Hutagogy, the teacher of the future is going to live more in Hutagogy than in andragogy or pedagogy. We have to be mentally prepared for this, where the student is going to decide what he or she wants to learn, and the student is also going to decide how much, how well, he or she is going to learn. When you look at a ladder where we have pedagogy, andragogy, and pedagogy, if you really see, learner maturity and autonomy are most in pedagogy. So you are going to live. The future of today's teacher is in a situation where you are going to live in pedagogy, where you are going to allow the student to blossom to mature, to have some autonomy at the same time. You are going to live in the age of Hutagogy where the instructor control is least. A very uncomfortable feeling for most teachers where you lose control of your students' learning. Not really in the sense of lose control of learning, but at least you really don't tell them in so many words how they go about doing things. So we have to be aware of this. So the teacher of the future is going to live in Hutagogy and this life is going to be where you have less instructor control and more learner maturity and autonomy. An article which uh, 
I co-authored that appeared in Medical Teacher Futagogic Approach to Developing Capable Learners is a very basic introduction to how futagogy is going to change the way we function. And the sooner we are aware of this, the better it is for us, lest we become disillusioned. This is another article, Futagogy through Facebook for millennial learners as uh, millennial learners. They are what Ron Harden says, they are just in time learners. They want to see the relevance and learn. That is what Harden says is just in time as against just in case. We always teach people saying just in case you need, we teach you something. So our concept of teaching is just in case, just in case we teach so many things. But today's students says, I want to know what is relevant to me today. I'm not worried about tomorrow. And that is why millennial learners, they're very different from the way we learn and we need to be aware of this. We have seen measurement of the scholarship of teaching. We have seen the teacher of the future. We'll now go on to the third component, the hidden roles of a teacher. Now, why did I call this hidden roles of a teacher? There are certain obvious roles, certain apparent roles, certain overt roles, which all of us know. And that has been beautifully given by Harden. Harden gave the 12 roles of a teacher. It actually summarizes into six major roles. The role of a teacher as information provider, resource developer, planner, assessor, facilitator, and role model. These are the six fundamental roles of a teacher, which Ron Harden spoke about. This can be subdivided into providing this information in a lecture or in a practical situation, resource development as resource material creator, writing study guides, books, and so on, planning, course organizer and curriculum planner, student assessor and curriculum evaluator, as a facilitator, learning facilitator, and as a mentor, and as a role model teaching role model and on the job role model. Now this is well known. All of us are aware of this, the 12 roles. This is nothing new. This is what Ron Harden said, and it is true. All of us play our roles in all these segments, though not equally, depending on your responsibility and your roles, you may be playing uh, more or less uh, some uh, role in each one of these segments and it will change. But let us be aware, this awareness is needed that for you to be a complete teacher, you must be contributing in all these 12 roles. Having said that, now I ask this question, who is a teacher? What is that hidden role of a teacher? A teacher needs to open the mind, touch the heart and hold the hand of a student. To accomplish this, the teacher has to play several roles the historian, the sleuth, the visionary, the symbol, the potter, the poet, the actor, and the healer. The teacher is, as a historian blends the past with the present and propels the student into the future. The teacher as a sleuth is a detective who probes the values and beliefs and personifies the philosophy of teaching. The teacher as a visionary has the foresight to paint a great future in the heart of the student. The teacher as a symbol affirms values through his demeanor and attitude. The teacher as a potter is a sculptor who uses gentleness and kindness to chip through the barriers and reveal the magnificent soul within a student. The teacher as a poet uses language to shape, sustain and refurbish the joy of learning. The teacher as an actor improvises and improves the culture of the organization. The teacher as a healer softens the trials and tribulations and oversees transitions and change. For playing these multiple roles, the teacher has to be an artist, a craftsman, and a scientist. For this, the incarnation of a teacher must unfold as an astute artist, a canny craftsman, and a sublime 
scientist. These are the hidden roles of a teacher. Many years ago, when I was the vice chancellor of the university, we celebrated Teacher's Day. And I spoke to my teachers, instead of giving the usual speech, I composed it for the Teacher's Day to share it with them, to remind them there are many hidden roles that you have, which you need to be aware of, just making them aware that these roles are all to be played by you if you need to function as a teacher. What is the teacher's prayer? Now the word prayer is associated with asking something. We seek something, we beseech something, we want something. That is what a prayer is normally understood as. But I am telling you, a teacher's prayer is one of giving, unconditional giving, give, give, give and give. And what is this teacher's prayer? That way I want you to view the teacher's prayer as different from the prayer that we are also used asking, seeking, beseeching. What is this teacher's prayer of giving? And it is this. I will teach you in a room. I will teach you now on Zoom. I will teach you in a house. I will teach you with my mouse. I will teach you here or there. I will teach you because I care. My love, my care, my concern for you is what matters. And that is my prayer. That is my dedication. That is my song to you. That is my serenade to you, my dear students. This is what we as teachers, it should be our prayer and our commitment to our students. I now ask you, what is teaching? Teaching is more about the humanity inside the teacher rather than the technology outside the teacher. Teaching is more about a role we celebrate than a chore we tolerate. Teaching is more about outcome rather than income. Teaching is more about an affair of the heart than a matter of the head. Teaching is about identity, intensity, integrity, and individuality of the teacher. Teaching is about commitment and connections. Commitment to the cause, connections with our students. Teaching is about living and loving, living the role and loving our job. Teaching is about learning and yearning, learning to improve, yearning to excel. Teaching is about passion and precision, passion to convince, precision to convey. Teaching is about rigor and elegance, rigor of preparation, elegance of performance. Teaching is about blooming and blossoming, blooming of the teacher and blossoming of the students. Teaching is about pondering and peering, pondering the past for reflection and peering into the future for projection. Teaching is less about preaching and more about reaching and touching, reaching out to our students and touching their lives. Individually, we enjoy teaching. Collectively, we celebrate teaching. Let us celebrate teaching as a vocation. Let us celebrate teaching as a commitment. Let us celebrate teaching as a profession. Let us celebrate teaching as an obsession. This is again composed with love from me to each and every one of you fellow teachers. Wish you all a joyful teacherhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ram Narayan. Uh, when you uh, said that you're going to celebrate uh, teacherhood, I didn't know it would be such a festival. And when you said that a teacher has to be a poet, you, you actually exemplified every part of it. For, th for those of us who are trying to walk the tightrope between uh, teaching and research, you allayed a lot of fears and anxieties that yes, you can celebrate uh, the, the joys of teacherhood and uh, still be uh, uh, actually recognized for it. And um, it is important that we uh, make the uh, important measurable rather than the measurable important, as you said. Uh, so I think you should come back to uh, speaking to teachers uh, in frequent intervals, especially when we feel low, because uh, you are the right person who makes us feel proud about uh, uh, teaching. And uh, we need that pep up talk from you all the time. Thank you very much. It's been a very heartening and exhilarating listening to you. Uh, over to Sanjay, please, for the formalities. 
Thank you, sir, for this. Each slide was worth its uh, weight in gold and worth uh, discussing again and again. We can create a full uh, one hour lecture on each slide. I think we'll try some someday. So uh, on behalf of MEU India, uh, the entire uh, group, uh, our advisors and teachers, uh, we feel proud to present you with the, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And also, uh, we are grateful to you for delivering this uh, uh, Rita Sood Memorial Oration. And uh, we are sure that it must have benefited a lot of uh, the listeners and those who will listen the recording. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So with these, uh, uh, we can, I think we can, we can end the session. Sanjay, I think Dr. Vinay Kumar's comment would be very valuable. Yes. And I request you to please uh, uh, allow a minute. Uh, Dr. Yes, Venekumar, sir. sir, please. Yes. Uh, uh, well, first I have to say that, Dr. Ramnarayan, I was in a trance. <laughs> During your presentation, I was in a trance. I was, I was not on the earth. I was somewhere else. Okay, Somewhere else where the depth that you uh, described is visible and palpable. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, as you know, I'm a at heart teacher. And so for me, this was just enlightening, as I said, transforming. Now, the, the comment I want to make is the following. And that is that you correctly pointed out that tension between research, education, and other type of work, okay? And, and trying to make uh, a jack of all trades and master of none, so to say, the way we do it. So what I, I'll tell you what I did when I became department chairman in 2000, I said, the department will have three functions, teaching, research, and clinical, clinical service. But not everybody has to be doing that. As I told the dean, as a department, we will fulfill all of these expectations. But don't ask me how much research is this person doing and not doing. Now, this is easy to say, but difficult to do. So let me tell you a little anecdote. Uh, I recruited a young resident who had finished residency with us. Uh, to be a junior faculty member. And, you know, one day he came to me and said, Dr. Kumar, I will not be a researcher. I know University of Chicago is known for research, but I will not be a teacher. I said, what will you be? He said, I will be the world's best teacher. I said, I said if that's what you want to be, you have a place in this department. And who's that person? Hussein Sattar the author of widely used Pathoma. I'm sure you have heard of Pathoma. There's hardly any medical student in the world who doesn't sort of use, use Pathoma. So he, he, he said, I will become the best teacher in the world. And I, I sort of, I shouldn't say I allowed him. I helped him to believe that it could be done. And he did it. So I think that we have to be very conscious. We have to be very careful when we, as senior people, when we deal with the expectations and aspirations and uh, of, 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 of faculty members who are, uh, who are in a department where all three missions have to be carried out, but not by, by the same person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vinay Kumar, for your wise words. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this oration. I, wish all of you a very happy evening ahead. So have a pleasant day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tejinder. Thank you, Professor Anshu. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sanjay. You, thank you, thank so you much, all sir. very much. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Good night. The comments are pouring in the section, the chat section. Yes.